Hello, everyone. Welcome. Glad to uh, welcome you all here on what was a lovely afternoon and still is lovely if the rain will hold off for a bit. Glad to see you all here. My name is Spencer Fluman. I'm the executive director of the Neil A. Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship here at BYU. And we are thrilled to have you here today for this presentation and panel discussion that hopefully will include some uh, marvelous questions from the audience as well. So please keep track of uh, questions that come to mind. Um, we begin uh, events like this at BYU with a word of prayer. And I've invited uh, Sandra Shirtliff, um, an executive assistant at the Maxwell Institute, to give our opening prayer, after which I will, uh, inv I will introduce our participants today. Our Father in heaven, we are grateful for the opportunity to be gathered here today. We are grateful for this chance to hear from these speakers and their studies and the ways in which they've contributed to society. And we ask for thy guidance and thy help that we will be able to learn and to enjoy uh, learning from each other and increasing in knowledge and our understanding. And we say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We're honored today to have with us uh, Kenneth L. Woodward, who served as religion editor at Newsweek for nearly 40 years, reporting on a variety of subjects from seven continents. He's the author of more than 750 Newsweek articles, uh, nearly 100 cover stories for Newsweek. His numerous other articles, essays, and book reviews have appeared in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, Commonweal, First Things in America, among other venues as well. He's been a news commentator for NBC, for ABC, for CBS. He's going to speak today uh, from his most recent book, Getting Religion, Faith, Culture, and Politics from the Age of Eisenhower to the Ascent of Trump. After his remarks, we're going to have two brief uh, reflections on the book and on his uh, presentation. I'll introduce those respondents now uh, to keep me uh, away from the podium until the end. Uh, first, we'll hear from J.B. Hawes. Uh, professor Hawes is an associate professor of church history and doctrine here at BYU. He's the coordinator of BYU's Office of Religious Outreach which focuses on academic interfaith dialogue. His PhD is from the University of Utah in American history. And his research interests center on the place of Mormonism in the religious and cultural landscape of 20th and 21st century America. He's the author of The Mormon Image in the American Mind, 50 Years of Public Perception, published by Oxford University Press a couple of years back. He'll be followed by Kelsey Dallas. Kelsey's a religion, the religion reporter for the Deseret News, serving on the, that publication's in-depth team. She tracks faith-based social trends, legal action related to religious freedom law, and developments at the intersection of faith and politics. She's received several awards for her work, including recognition from Religion News Association and the American Association for the Advancement of Science. This spring, Kelsey received a Wilbur Award from the Religion Communicators Council for her coverage of Sikh soldiers in the U.S. Army. Kelsey received a Master's of Arts in Religion degree in 2014 from Yale University, Yale University Divinity School. She holds bachelor's degrees in English, Economics, and Religious Studies from the University of Iowa. Will you join me in welcoming first uh, Kenneth L. Woodward. Welcome. Thank you, Spencer. Um, if you have a problem hearing me, raise a hand, do a dance, whatever. I don't see, I, I guess it's summertime, I don't see a lot. Are there any students here? Even graduate students? Oh, there's a couple. You students. Does the, uh, does the, uh, the date, June 9, 
1978 mean anything to you? Anybody except for professors who are supposed to know? <laughs> well, I could tell you that it's the um, it's the date that um, Larry Holmes beat Kenny Norton for the WBC uh, heavyweight championship, but something else happened here, which was the announcement that uh, a revelation had been given to the first presidency. Uh, that people of color, mainly African Americans, uh, could receive the priesthood. Now, if you don't know that date, um, I'm going to be talking about a number of people that are going to seem like ancient history to you. <laughs> so I'm a little bit nervous. Um, and I hope you do recognize some of these names, and I'm sure you will. Okay. I'd like to begin this afternoon by asking why since the turn of the century, religion has ceased to be an important factor in American public life. More precisely, why are there no American religious leaders, thinkers, movements, or ideas capable of capturing public attention and influencing public life? And if you think of any, correct me. And by public life, I include not only politics and social movements, but also public intellectuals whose work shapes our public discourses, the artists who give us vision, and the media that organizes, disseminates, and critiques our popular cultural products. In contrast, throughout the second half of the 20th century, beginning with the post-war era, religion was very much a part of American public life and discourse. For example, numerous American religious figures and issues made the covers of Newsweek and Time and Life. And these were the nation's billboards. They were headlined in major newspapers around the country and were discussed regularly on television. Religion was prime time news and prime fodder for talk shows like Meet the Press and Nightline. Think of Martin Luther King Jr., Billy Graham. Uh, the Catholic Bishop Fulton J. Sheehan, whose weekly program was once the highest rated on television. Think of theologians Reinhold Niebuhr, Paul Tillich, and John Courtney Murray, along with the era's most public Christian heretic, Episcopal Bishop James A. Pike, all of whom appeared on the cover of Time magazine. Think of the Berrigan brothers, Rabbi Abraham Heschel, Yale chaplain William Sloan Coffin, religious leaders in the anti-Vietnam uh, War movement. Think of Dorothy Day, founder of the Catholic Workers, Thomas Merton, Henry Nouwen, Catholic spiritual writers read by millions of people around the world in and outside of the Catholic Church. Think of churchmen like your own president and prophet Spencer Kimball, Chicago's Cardinal Joseph Bernadine, and Notre Dame's Father Theodore M. Hesburgh, recall towering religious literary figures like Flannery O'Connor, J.F. Powers, Walker Percy, T.S. Eliot, W.H. Auden, English, yes, but living in um, Bohemia, New York. Think, too, of secular theology, liberation theology, black theology, feminist theology. Remember Dr. Sun Myung Moon and his Moonies, the Jesus Seminars, whose savants voted on which biblical sayings attributed to him Jesus really said. Remember tele-evangelism, transcendental meditation, the Hare Krishnas, and the brief but headline-grabbing God is Dead movement. Most of these religious figures, movements, and theologies emerge in consonance with social and political upheavals that punctuated the era. Imagine the civil rights movement without Dr. King and his Southern Christian Leadership Conference. The anti-war movement without the Berrigan brothers, William Sloan Coffin, and clergy and laymen concerned about Vietnam. Ronald Reagan's overt and covert interventions in the civil wars in Nicaragua, Salvador, and much uh, of Latin America without liberation theology and the Christian-based communities it created. And the first one was created by an American. 
And yet, that is precisely what Ken Burns imagined in his recent seven-part series on Vietnam. Apart from King's speech announcing his opposition to the war, no other religious figure is mentioned. Not the Berrigans, not Rabbi Heschel, none of the clergy who counseled large numbers of young men called up in the military draft, not the National Council of Churches, which stocked both the civil rights and the anti-war movements with chaplains and Christian foot soldiers. How quickly we forget. It seems to me, however, that socially and politically, the first 17 years of this century have been every bit as volatile as the middle years of the last century. Two years into the new millennium, 3,000 American citizens were killed in terrorist attacks on 9-11, the first such attack in American soil and one that demonstrated that the American homeland is no longer immune from such atrocities committed by outsiders. A month later, U.S. troops invaded Afghanistan, and in 2003, they invaded near Iraq. As a result, we now have been at war for by far the longest continuous period in American history. Then in 2007, our $8 trillion housing bubble burst, causing the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression, and an ever-widening gap between the very rich and everyone else. And today, we are still trying to figure out the meaning of having Donald Trump as president, as is he. <laughs> and yet, throughout this opening period of the new millennium, there were no anti-war movements of any consequence. I don't remember any at all. Perhaps because there is no military draft. No poor people's march on Washington, as there was in the last century. Perhaps because for eight years our first African-American president occupied the White House. No pastoral letters on the economy from the American Catholic bishops, as there was in 1986 perhaps because the bishops know that the complexities of global economics are beyond their pay grade. No national religious mobilization of any kind, probably because there are no religious leaders to do the mobilizing, and no religious voices because there are none of stature whose words the people of this country would likely heed. For example, no one has replaced Billy Graham, either as an evangelist or as the one figure other evangelicals watch to gauge where the center of, of evangelicalism is at the moment and where it is likely headed. His son and sound alike, Franklin, has no national following and also none of his father's virtues. Most Catholics cannot name the president of the U.S. Catholic Conference of Catholic Bishops. I had to look it up myself or what positions the hierarchy has taken on national issues apart from abortion and immigration. As for the once mighty voice of liberal mainline Protestantism, the National Council of Churches has so shriveled in size, financial support, and influence uh, that the council left New York because it could no longer afford the salaries or the rent. And American Jews will, in just a few more decades, be outnumbered out, uh, by American Muslims. What's going on? Some answers immediately suggest themselves. One popular theory is that the secularism that has engulfed Western Europe is only now manifesting itself in this country. And therefore, religious voices are neither welcome nor missed in public life. There is more than a little evidence to support uh, the secularization thesis, though there is also considerable intellectual disagreement as to what exactly secularism is. I'd welcome Dr. Hawes' thoughts on this. As a partial answer, historian Martin Marty points to the cultural shift created by the move from print to digital media. When there were only three news magazines, and three television networks, and even regional newspapers carried abundant national and international do, news, which they no longer do, these outlets wielded a kind of cultural authority that no form of media, including digital, does today. 
Putting a religious figure or movement on the cover of Newsweek signaled to readers that the editors regarded the subject as, an, as, as important. On this point, I therefore look to Ms. Dallas's thoughts on how the new media culture has impacted national awareness of American religion. Yes, there are religious issues, but as I say, movements, authority figures, um, uh, people who uh, 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 shape public opinion, I don't see them. From one historical angle, then, the history of American religion in the second half of the 20th century is a narrative of declining numbers, energy, and influence. But in part, that's because of when this story begins. Post-war America, specifically the two decades between 1945 and 1965, which is what I refer to when I say the 50s, it's a 20-year period, turned out to be the most religious period in American history, if we think of religion as invoking high rates of religious belief, behavior, and especially belonging. At that time, most Americans identified with the triad of Protestant Catholic Jew. It was a time when Americans built more churches and synagogues than ever before or since, and a majority worshiped weekly in them as well. It was a time when the ministry as a career was so attractive that Protestant seminaries could turn down applicants the way that Ivy League universities do now. And the people who applied were people who were thinking of becoming doctors and lawyers and captains of industry. So they drew from the top shelf. By 1960, half of all school-aged Catholic children attended the church's parochial schools, and the numbers of priests and nuns were at record highs. When asked, 98% of Americans said they believed in God, and by God, most meant the God of the Bible, there being few alternative deities at the time. What's more, American culture and politics supported religion, we were in a Cold War with atheist communism, and to be American was to believe in God. When, in 1956, the uh, Republican National uh, Committee um, went so far as to declare, declare President Eisenhower, quote, not only the political leader, but the spiritual leader of our times, end of quote. Not even the Democratic leadership challenged that statement. Imagine that happening today. As we now know, the post-war era was exceptional. In religion, we've experienced nothing like it before or since. But also in literature, in the arts, and economic equality and prosperity as well. In any case, uh, from a high like this, there probably was no direction for the nation's religious barometer to go but down. Still, no one then could have predicted what we have today. I want to mention one other part of this, too, that comes to my mind, and it's from my book. But when I was a kid growing up um, in the late 40s and the early 50s, um, all the, if, certainly in the broad middle class, and there was, the middle class was broad, all the fathers went off to work on Monday morning. And they all came back at uh, six o'clock at night, and then they came back, and all came back in unison. It seemed like on the weekends, and nobody worked on the weekends. Uh, as I describe it, the weekends were strung like a hammock between the fathers going away on, uh, uh, coming home on Friday and going to work on Monday. Um, we don't have work weeks like that anymore, any more than we have eight-hour days anymore. We become an incredible work society, and there is a connection. There is a connection, at least in scripture, a connection between work and leisure. I mean, between religion and leisure. Um, a current pie chart of American religion would look something like this. No more than 25% of American adults place religion at or near uh, the center of their lives. And we're not talking about Mother Teresa's here. Uh, another 25%, uh, the nons, identify with no religion. Some nons say they are spiritual, and some say they believe in God. But it's not clear what sort of God they are talking about or what being spiritual really means. A lot of it means going to the spa and doing a little meditation and doing a little yoga. Uh, 
The other 50% range from occasional church attenders and cultural Christians and cultural Jews um, to those who inhale the vapors from prosperity preachers like Joel Osteen, uh, who tells them what God can do for you, not what you can do for God, and those who hearken to the therapeutic ministrations of Oprah-style pastors. Popular preachers still find audiences because preaching is a performance art, but they don't create communities or form Christian, uh, disciplined Christians or Jews. You Mormons take heed. Notre Dame sociologist Christian Smith, after following a representative cohort of young Americans from high school through college and into what he calls apprentice adulthood, um, has famously described their religion as moralistic therapeutic deism. And since I find out a lot of people are not familiar with that term, I'm going to explain it. Um, because I suspect that the operative religion of a great many American adults uh, is being just that. For those not familiar with the term, here's what Smith means, quote, First, a God exists who created and ordered the world and watches over human life on earth. Second, God wants people to be good, to be nice, to be fair to each other as taught in the Bible and other world religions. Footnote, the word nice does not appear in the Bible. Third, the central goal in life is to be happy and to feel good about oneself. Fourth, God does not need to be particularly involved in one's life, except when God is needed to resolve a problem. Fifth, good people go to heaven when they die. People don't like to talk about a hell. God wouldn't, be, wouldn't do that to us. Um, and they wouldn't be that bad to deserve it. Uh, this, I submit, is religion with a shrug. There are a number of reasons why the triad of Protestant Catholic Jew has lost market share over the last 70 years. Blurred identity is one. But most obvious is a manifest failure to pass on the faith. But again, that is only one part of the story. The other part of the story, the history of the second half of the 20th century, is that in the later decades of the 20th century, um, we experienced an enormous amount of religious experimentation and activity. Otherwise, I would have switched to another beat when I was a journalist. <laughs> so in the time left to me, I will focus on some of the different ways in which Americans got religion in the second half of the 20th century, and how these forms connected religion to the wider transformations in American culture and society. Indeed, I would argue how you get religion shapes the kind of religion you get, regardless of the content of that religion. We see, for example, quite often, in the, uh, we see the differences between converts to a particular religion and those who were raised in it from the cradle. In the post-war era, most Americans got religion through their parents, extended family networks, ethnic neighborhoods, and the religious, in religious institutions nested therein. Geography also mattered greatly, as the historical atlas of American religion attests. In some places, it still matters. Um, despite increased mobility, there are still many regions in the United States where certain religions go with the territory, beginning with, obviously, right here in Utah. If you grew up in Wisconsin or Minnesota, chances are your roots were either Lutheran or Catholic. And don't forget all those towns in Alabama, Georgia, and Mississippi where, it seems, there are more Baptists than there are people. I call religion acquired that way embedded religion. It's a reminder that, historically, religion has been more about social bonds than individual choice. Within these social bonds, at once religious, ethnic, geographical, the young were communally formed. Habitations foster habits. Religious habits are shared habits. So indeed, if the young are not uh, only to become habituated to religion, religious practice, but also to absorb its lore, it does indeed take a village. Mormons know that in their bones. 
Um, the 50s also saw the emergence of what I have come to call movement religion. By that I mean the forms that religious activism took once the civil rights movement under Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, became the new and accepted mode for expressing and mobilizing religious conscience and commitment. I also mean the cor correlative impulse of secular movements to assume the trappings of a religious crusade or quest. In either form, and often in combination, movement religion was directed as much against religious institutions as it was against secular establishments. Movement religion was the direct opposite of embedded religion. Where you came from, your own religious identity or lack of one, these things didn't matter. To become a part of a movement was to adopt a new group identity, as in the expression, we in the movement, that often assumed precedence over all previous identities. Regardless of the cause, and God knows there were plenty of causes around which Americans could and did uh, form movements, uh, movement people all spoke the same idiom. To be in the movement was to support the struggle, to fight for liberation, to resist oppression, to bear witness, to speak truth to power, in a word, to be prophetic. The evil that movements hurled against, uh, themselves against was never merely personal. It was always systemic. The military, the government, the university, the churches, the bourgeois family, uh, these and other institutions oppressed because their very structures were corrupt. Movements, on the other hand, created brotherhoods and sisterhoods, pure bonds of human solidarity, or so it was thought. Whatever the cause, history and righteousness were aligned with the movement. For many movement leaders like feminist Betty Friedan and Gloria Steinem, both secular Jews, the movement was their religion. Movement religion inaugurated a period in American history similar in many ways to the great awakenings of the 18th and 19th centuries. Echoing those earlier religious eruptions, the 20th century saw a democratization of spiritual enthusiasm and spiritualities, the emergence of new religions and cults, and a corresponding rejection of established religions and, and institutions. I can only briefly treat these new, uh, new ways in which Americans got religion, but what I want to stress is that, as in the past, they sprang out of very particular social and cultural uh, developments. For example, the social, cultural, and religious upheavals that began in the mid-60s might never have happened without the demographic bulge. We call them the baby boomers that overwhelmed first the grade schools they got into, then the high schools, and finally the, the universities. Uh, and since then, uh, every other social institution or social uh, an age niche on their way to retirement. By 1969, almost half the American population was 25 years of age or under. We're going in the opposite direction right now with the boomers. Um, and with every move these boomers made, they also made news. One of the most significant moves young Americans made involved turning away from the social, uh, away from social and political action, especially after the military draft was abolished, to embrace new forms of spirituality. Most of these spiritual enthusiasms were based, um, however loosely, on Hindu and Buddhist med meditation practices. I have medication written down here, but that's not true. Um, as well as Native American rituals and Mesoamerican shamanism. Remember Carlos Castaneda, some of you old folks, his books uh, were very popular at the time. Anything at all but the religion of their parents and their grandparents. At the time, it was called the counterculture, but I call it experiential religion, where movement religion sought to transform society Experiential religion sought the transformation of self. What the young practitioners were seeking was the experience of themselves as sacred selves, inhibiting, uh, inhabiting a sacred universe. 
and they were willing to accept any sort of belief system for as long, but only as long, as it facilitated the desired experience. But there would have been no turn to Eastern religions without two enabling social events. First was the change in U.S. immigration policies in 1968, which allowed more immigrants from India and Tibet and other Asian countries than previous policies tolerated. You couldn't learn meditation practices unless you had access to a Buddhist tulku or a Hindu guru. Second, there would have been no such quest for religious experience if it weren't for the drug culture that preceded it. What else was the experience of sacred selves but a trip without the aid of acid? Now, some of you might remember two famous Harvard uh, uh, researchers who worked on LSD. One was Richard Alpert, and you, if you, uh, you might know him today uh, as Ram Das, the longtime resident uh, guru of San Francisco, switched LSD to uh, Hinduism and becoming a guru yourself. The second, and many ways more interesting fellow, was Timothy Leary. Timothy Leary was the one that said, uh, had, had a phrase, um, I'm trying to remember, tune in, um, drop out, tune in, and, and something else. Okay. Uh, and he was really a herald for, for LSD. And he tells the story of how he uh, um, once brought LSD to a Hindu temple, mixed it with water from the, from the Ganges, the holy river in India, and they all imbibed, and suddenly everybody got transformed into Hindu gods and, with their consorts. And he, of course, was Shiva, whose symbol is the erect phallus. So you can imagine what kind of a party that was. Um, the image should stress the connection that I can't be strong enough between the drug culture preceding the culture into, um, into meditation and, and Eastern spirituality. Now, for a, a moment, let's examine a third form of American religion that emerged in the second half of the 20th century. Between 1961 and 1979, experts, and this would be J. Gordon Melton, for those who like footnotes, estimated that some 370 religious cults emerged. Some of them new, uh, some of them resuscitated from previous history, uh, periods of social stress. The most dangerous cults were apocalyptic in message. Think of Jonestown and group suicide by Kool-Aid, or Heaven's Gate in San Diego where the suicide mix was a pudding. Most of them, however, were formed as what I call sacred families. Some, like the Church Universal, headed by Claire Prophet, were matriarchies some by prophetic patriarchs. But most of these families were headed by divine parents, like the Unification Church of Dr. and Mrs. Moon. Why then, and what was going on? Well, do you remember the name Daniel Patrick Moynihan? In 1965, he prepared a report on the African-American family for President Johnson, in which he described the growth of a permanent black underclass. The cause, he said, was not just the effects of slavery and Jim Crow, but also, more recently, the what he called tangle of pathology exhibited by children without fathers and mothers without husbands. Black leaders charged Moynihan with blaming the victims, and feminists, or at least some of them, argued that mother-dominated families were certainly better than traditional patriarchies. By the time Bill Clinton took office in 1982, Unwed white women were producing the same percentage of children as unwed black women had in 1965. Meanwhile, the percentage of fatherless black children had metastasized to nearly two out of three. As a nation, Americans had also achieved the highest divorce rate in the world. By then, Moynihan was a senator from New York. In a famous essay in The American Scholar, he noted that social behavior once considered deviant and destructive, especially when manifest by blacks, 
had become socially and morally tolerable now that such behavior was embraced as alternative lifestyles by middle-class whites. He entitled his essay, Defining Deviancy Down. Over the same period, a million children, children a year were running away from home. These were not poor kids or modern Huck Finns lighting out for the territories. They were mostly late high school and early college dropouts from the middle class, uh, middle and upper white, uh, upper middle white classes, looking for something secure that they didn't find at home. They were disproportionately children of secular Jews. A million runaways a year is more than enough to sustain a plague of cults, particularly if those cults present themselves as sacred families ruled by divinely guided parents. In this way, sacred families not only supplanted natural families, but gave recruits a religion to believe in. Not incidentally, it was during the, this period of family breakdown, I seem to recall, that the LDS Church began emphasizing um, the family home evening program, in part because so many bishops were spending too much of their time helping other families and sometimes neglecting their own. And also because they were worried they saw what was happening to the families and they didn't want it to, uh, happening to Mormon families. Um, in closing, if there is a lesson I can draw from my own remarks, it is that we cannot know what the future of American religion will be like until we have some idea of what transformations uh, in American social, cultural, and political life uh, we can anticipate. Thank you for listening. Now I get to hear what I did wrong. <laughs> who's going to speak for, who's? Well, hello everyone. Uh, it is a special treat to be here to hear from Kenneth Woodward. I've been interested for some time in American public perception of Mormons in the past 50 years or so. And as our train-loving BYU colleague Richard Bennett would say, that's a railway journey that you cannot take without traveling over track laid down by Kenneth Woodward. Mr. Woodward wrote what to me is a remarkably prescient piece in 1982 called Apostles versus Historians. It says something that what to many might have seemed like a minor in-house disagreement between college professors of history and institutional church hierarchs. And really, who would be surprised by that or find anything newsworthy in that? It says something that such discussions made the pages of Newsweek. I think Mr. Woodward understood something on a deeper level about the world inhabited by Mormons in the 1980s. So much of what is playing out today in the very robust world of Mormon history, including on the LDS Church institutional front, um, resonates with the currents and possibilities Woodward identified 35 years ago. His 1980 interview with Peggy Fletcher Stack for Sunstone and his 2001 Newsweek cover story about Mormons are two other must-reads. All of this is to say that Kenneth Woodward really does get religion, to play one more time with his, the apt title of his book. These Mormon examples can be multiplied over a number of religious traditions and over a number of decades. Part of that deep understanding, that just getting it, has to come, I think, through an ability to ask provocative questions, and he has asked some provocative questions today. So when Kenneth Woodward makes an observation and asks a related question, I think it's worth some exploration. Here are two of his questions that I think interrelate. The first is the question about secularism, or the status of secularism in today's religious world. And the second is the question that he opened with, where are American religious figures who also loom large in public life? I think as Mr. Woodward has suggested, these two questions should be considered together. And I like the line of thinking that he presents in the epilogue of his book. He's given us a few key points from that epilogue, but like a journalist who knows how to set a great hook, there is a lot more in the ep epilogue that beckons for a close reading. Not only is the book worth reading, it would also make a great Father's Day or belated Mother's Day gift. And it is an, an engaging book because it is filled with so many I remember that moments and a lot of I didn't realize how significant that was moments. All this and I'm not re receiving any commissions. It really is that good. Um, the epilogue is really that good too. He identifies some things about secularism that I find persuasive. If we think of secularism as something more than the subtraction thesis, to follow Charles Taylor's thinking from his landmark of secular age, that is, secularism is more than just the turn from faith as science and reason become more prominent. There is merit in thinking of the secular age as a world where religion is one option among many, hence this memorable line from Charles Taylor. 
Why was it virtually impossible not to believe in God in, say, 1500 in our Western society, but while in 2000 many of us find this not only easy, but even inescapable? But as Taylor argues, secularization as subtraction, the act of simply removing God from the equation or from the understood workings of the universe, is too simplistic and doesn't capture what seems to be going on. Even with the sharp rise of the nuns, of those who claim no religious affiliation, belief in a higher power remains the majority position. 72% of the nuns affirmed this in a December 2017 Pew study. But asking, as Mr. Woodward does, what kind of God, higher power, might tell more of the story, only 17% of the nuns believed, affirmed belief in God as described in the Bible. From Pew's December 2017 study, here's one more line. While roughly two-thirds of older adults say they believe in the biblical God, just 49% of those in their 30s and 40s, and just 43% of adults under 30s say the same. Even with this age gap, an overwhelming majority of the youngest adults continue to believe in God or a higher power. Eight in ten of those ages 18 to 29 say they believe in at least some kind of spiritual force. This persistent turn to transcendence, this persistent belief in a higher power, does exactly what Charles Taylor argues. It complicates the simple idea of secularization as subtraction, as reason displacing faith. It also speaks to his analysis of cross pressures in today's society where the secular mind and the religious heart might wrestle. The age gap that Pew identifies also manifests itself in something that Charles Taylor and Kenneth Woodard both identify, the rise of expressive individualism in religious believers. The creed of expressive individualism in Charles Taylor's words, quote, only accept what rings true to your inner self, or, quote, we shouldn't criticize each other's values. This is the new first great and sometimes only commandment, thou shalt not judge. If this individualism has undermined the link between Christian faith and civilization order, that's Charles Taylor again, then adherence to this expressive individualism may not need an institution or an institutional authority to facilitate a connection to God. None as a religious affiliation makes sense. Woodward in his epilogue also nods at Christ sociologist Christian Smith's work on moralistic therapeutic deism among a rising generation of American religious youth. Does religion and spirituality teach me to be nice? Check. Does it make me feel good? Check. Is God mostly hands off unless I need him, like some divine butler, to use sociologist Ken DeCreasy Dean's phrase? Check. Which brings us back to consider Woodward's opening question. Why are there so few American religious public figures? Surely the answer has as much to do with the decline of institutions generally, or trust in institutional authority, a decline which Woodward illustrates throughout his book. And much to do, too, with the proliferation of social media platforms and aggregation of like-minded followers. But one has to wonder also if there are no national explicators of the faith, partly because moralistic therapeutic deism does not need profound explication, or a prophet or a standard bearer in the religious world that already seems to have plenty outside the religious world. And if religion has become increasingly associated with intolerance, as in fundamentalism, or the religious right, or the ubiquitous in every news story, the 80% of white evangelicals who voted for President Trump, religious figures seem all the more morally suspect. Um, but I can see in this view of secularism, and in Kenneth Woodard's epilogue, and comments here, reasons to be hopeful about the future of serious religious thinking in public life. If belief still persists, if longing for transcendence persists, this can be read to say that in our increasingly complex world, there is room for, and I think most important, appetite for, the kind of religious thinkers Mr. Woodward calls for. Thinkers who can identify and describe with real substance, real messages that move us and challenge us and offer us new ways to come at new and old problems. Here's a closing caveat. To what degree could Pope Francis count as a, uh, this type of cover story news American religious figure. He's not from the US, but as a pope whose biography represents so many firsts, including the first Latin American pope, would his influence and reputation and stature in the United States qualify him as something of an anomaly or an exception to the trend Mr. Woodward is noting? And in that vein, what about Mitt Romney? You probably knew that question was coming. Uh, and here's the reason why I bring this up. In, at the Faith Angle Forum in 2007, Mr. Woodward had an, an important exchange with LDS historian Richard Bushman. When Bushman asked Kenneth Woodward if reporters who asked religion-related questions of Ms. Ro Mitt Romney should ask equivalent questions of Senator John McCain, Woodward was quick with his response. Here's his response. I don't think so. I think this is the Mormon time at bat. It will have to be done once, it seems to me, and then it won't have to be done again. So a decade later, what does that look like? Did that happen? Um, to what degree do Mitt Romney's political positions, statements, represent in media minds and the public mind religious positions? Is Mitt Romney regarded widely as a Mormon voice? Did and do his criticism of President Trump carry Mormon overtones? And to what degree is that how he was and is understood? Now, um, there will be plenty of good questions asked to Mr. Woodward, so if we don't have time for that question at this setting, um, 
maybe we can coax a few more wise column inches out of his pen. Thank you very much. First off, thanks to Maxwell Institute and all of BYU for the warm welcome to campus. It's been a pleasure to meet and speak alongside Mr. Woodward and Professor Hawes. Mr. Woodward has asked me to address how the new media culture has impacted American religion. That's a difficult question for me since the new media culture is the only media culture I've known. <laughs> I began reading the news regularly at a time when there was no longer such a thing as the national news. There are national outlets, sure, but each seems to address a specific segment of the American population. Although I'm a professional journalist, I get my news like most non-journalists, particularly those who are younger than 35. I click on the article links that look interesting to me in my Twitter feed or on my Facebook page, read them for as long as they hold my interest, and then reshare some of them with a witty observation. <laughs> in other words, media outlets have very little say in what I take to be each day's most pressing headlines. My friends and colleagues play a bigger role. In this media environment, faith groups and religious leaders don't gain as much as they used to even when they do make it onto the cover of a magazine or into a high profile article. Dinner table or water cooler conversations are just as likely and maybe more likely to be about a viral video or than some interesting news magazine piece. Top news sites publish dozens of articles each day. Even within the Washington Post faith section, a well-written overview of an exciting new worshiping community competes against thoughtful commentaries and analysis of breaking news. And so to draw attention to their advocacy work or community service program or impressive new theological analysis, faith groups and leaders have to take matters into their own hands. They have to earn a large following on social media or come up with a catchy hashtag. They have to convince congregation members to spread the group's message online, since many of us care more about a friend's recommendation than a complimentary news article. Few faith groups or religious leaders succeed. Those who do may have had to water down their religious message in order to appeal to as many people as possible. In this media environment, as Mr. Woodward notes, there are few religious figures, movements, or theologians that are an obvious choice for the front page. I haven't heard of many of the people who do get profiled, even though it's literally my job to follow faith-related developments in the U.S. However, I'd argue that this lack of must-write and must-read articles does have an upside. It leads to more creative approaches and to stories that surprise and delight me. Just in the last week, I've read about a Jewish matchmaker bringing together young single adults from Australia, Israel, and New York City. I've drawn lessons from the life of a young Christian theologian trying to remain hopeful in spite of a stage four cancer diagnosis. I've also argued with strangers on the internet about whether it's appropriate to choose Catholicism as a fashion show theme. In fact, from my perspective, the most obvious religion stories are less interesting than the ones that are hidden or more difficult to grasp. In January, I was in Los Angeles for a religion news conference. Several of the speakers and many of my faith beat friends that I've spoken with since then bemoaned the fact that President Donald Trump and his group of evangelical advisors seem to have taken the religion beat hostage over the last two years. Religion reporters have felt obligated to write regularly about President Trump's relationship to the white evangelical Christian community. We play up his faith-related decisions and get quotes from the same group of people over and over again. In doing so, religion reporters do perform a service. We help explain religion's complicated relationship to politics and try to correct problematic assumptions. But the religion beat is at its best when there is a balance in the type of stories being told. For every update on an official church policy change or a prominent statement, there should be a reflection on new developments among people in the pews. The current decline in religious practice and the disappearance of prominent religious figures is troubling for those of us who are fans of religion. But as a reporter, I think this situation has freed me up to tell and find new kinds of faith stories. 
I can explain the areas of public life in which religious groups continue to wield unexpected influence behind the scenes and explore the thought systems that have taken their place in the areas in which they don't. There may be a smaller audience for stories that are solely about religion these days, but that's why I work to ensure each of my articles is also about family life or power dynamics or morality or some other enduring concern. There's a sense in which religion reporters today have to learn to tell stories in a way that makes them impossible to ignore. After reading Mr. Woodward's book, Getting Religion, I can't deny that religion plays a lesser role in public life today than it did in the last 50 years of the 20th century. And I'll also admit that faith is covered very differently by the media. But I'd submit that these changes aren't all bad. The new media landscape has created room for new types of religion coverage, like podcasts by young American Muslims and quirky stories about whether a CrossFit gym functions like a faith community. Each religion article that's written today may receive less attention than the cover stories Mr. Woodward used to write and edit, but the amount of work being done on the religion bee as a whole better captures the diversity of religious practices present in the contemporary world. It's exciting for me to be able to follow what religious groups are up to in the shadows of American life, and my to-do list is always full of possible stories to tell. We've got uh, a couple of minutes here um, for questions from the audience. And so if you have a question, uh, raise your hand. Uh, I can call on you. I, I think, uh, Ken, we ought to have you come forward. I suspect you'll need to comment. Uh, and then JB and Kelsey can run up as needed as well. Uh, but we'll need, we'll need to, we've got about seven minutes, so no pressure, but they need to be good questions <laughs> that are more like questions than short lectures. Uh, please, here, and you'll need to stand and speak up if that's okay. What opportunities do you see to rekindle American religious life in the next, uh, say, decade or so? What opportunities for what? What opportunities do you see to possibly rekindle aspects of American religious life in the next decade or so? Um, I don't think prospects. Are, I don't think prospects are good. I mean, it, it, the problem with passing on the faith, whatever the situation is, whatever the faith is, is um, if you turn out, a, you do a bad job on Generation A. They're the parents of Generation B. And the crippling effect moves along until something happens to change it. And that's certainly what has happened, um, in my judgment, with the Catholic Church in the United States, but not only in the United States. There was a tremendous upheaval in the Church with Vatican Council II. Many good things happened, but it takes usually 50 years for, the, for everything to get ironed out. They didn't tell us that when, at the time, but that's been true of previous uh, councils. And um, so the whole apparatus by which little Catholics grew up to be big Catholics was terribly disruptive. Uh, that's all I want to say. So it's really hard to change uh, a movement that I'm calling down, a downward movement. I want to say just a couple of things in response. First of all, with respect to um, um, uh, the new media in which we were talking about. It reminded me of Robert Coles. I don't know if you ever know his name or, or any of his books, but he was a wonderful writer, wrote uh, uh, Children of Crisis. He's a towering figure as a writer uh, back in the day, back in my day in any case. And he always pointed out the fact that, they say, the he's from, Bo he's from Boston, taught at Harvard, um, but he didn't like Harvard all that much, even though he went to school there. And he would say, you know, the Boston papers tell you what the news is. But it's the, your buddy who you drink with on Friday nights after you've worked in the factory all day long is your buddies who will tell you what to think about it. And that's an old phenomenon, you know. You can put it in the paper, but how I think about it, don't tell me how to think about it. And I think that's true. And you, it's only become more amplified with the new media. In other words, something might happen, but it's the people that I'm on Facebook with and Twitter with and all that kind of thing. Um, 
But I also don't think social media are social, so that's another issue we can have. I think that's the biggest misnomer I've ever heard in my life. As for Mitt Romney, um, I did offer him some, uh, some adv uh, unwanted advice. Um, by the way, Mitt Romney, when I interviewed him, was wearing uh, no suit and the clothes were brown. Shirt was blue. And he looked athletic. He didn't look stiff. Being governor of Massachusetts, Massachusetts stiffened him a lot, and I think that was a mistake. He was very loosey-goosey, um, as much as Mitt Romney can be. Um, <laughs> But the, the, the point I wanted to make is that uh, I told him he had, we would probably have to confront the issue. Um, and there was, and they went, the, the, the campaign went back and forth on it. But I noticed, and I think I put this in the book, but uh, before he was elected, 80, something like 85% of Americans said that they knew little or nothing about Mormons, which makes your incredibly uh, big um, communications um, uh, uh, operation look kind of silly, doesn't it, in a way? I don't know what they thought about that. Well, after the election, he, he didn't. He, he, he did what he did, and you all know what he did. Uh, but he basically referred everything to the communications department of the church. Afterwards, the polls showed 85% still didn't know any more about the, uh, Mormonism than they did beforehand. So in a sense, his strategy worked. Those issues that could be divisive um, um, and new, since people don't know uh, uh, Mormonism very well, um, didn't erupt. Um, and so my hat's off to Mitt, he did, they did the right thing uh, after all. Um, as for the Pope, I just want to mention one thing. We selectively hear this Pope. We hear mercy, but we don't hear sin. Now that very first interview, he said, you know, I, I'm, um, I'm um, somebody who's uh, you know, been subject to the, you know, receiving the mercy of God. But he said he was a sinner. Now, funny how we don't hear sin, we hear mercy. Uh, it's more pleasing, it sounds nicer, and so forth. So I feel sorry for this Pope in some respects that we don't always hear what he said. We selectively hear because they, the, the media selectively looked for something. When he said, don't, who am I to judge, he wasn't saying what everybody thought he was saying. He was offered a specific issue about priests who are, uh, who are, who are gay, and it was hedged in. He said, who am I to judge? Um, so um, even if you're Pope, it's very hard to get your, um, you know, your point across. <laughs> yes? Um, yeah, so my question is, and you probably addressed this more in your book, uh, when we talk about these general themes about America not being as religious, not as many public figures as religious, I think one of the important caveats is African Americans and Mexican Americans, who their levels of religiosity seem to stay. Uh, After what? Uh, that African Americans and Mexican Americans have remained as religious over the last few decades, uh, whereas others have kind of gone. I'm wondering why that doesn't fit into our general narratives of American religiosity, because when we think about, oh, America is losing its religion, we're not thinking about the, the diverse America, which is staying, staying just as religious. Well, I mean, somebody said to me, uh, you, you don't talk about Islam, or a reviewer, did, you don't talk about Islam in your book. Well, Islam was not a player in the second half of the 20th century. Uh, there were immigrants there, you know, if you, you were in Dearborn, Michigan, you knew a lot of, of, of um, Muslims from different parts of the country, but they didn't play, they didn't do enough in public life to be observed. This is not a book about religion in America, it's really a book about, as, as it impacted, um, common life in America, and um, Islam unfortunately didn't really call, uh, get people's attention until 9-11, and that's not the way you want to get people's attention. They were there, they formed their own communities, um, they formed a mosque according to the Muslims that came from one country and then another, and they kept, they kept uh, you know, a, a rather low profile, and it was all rather local. So. Um, as far as the Hispanic uh, is concerned, yeah, I mean, it's going to be big for Catholicism in particular, but also you've got an awful lot of evangelicals who, uh, who uh, but they're just beginning to throw their weight around. I would love for you to think, I, I would love to think that the 
the family-centered nature of Hispanic uh, life and all of that would stay warm and we'd, we'd have that and they would bring that to what is much needed in our country. But it's also possible that the reverse could happen, that they lose that. So if I were had your job, I'd keep my eye on that because that's a long-term, that's a long-term issue, it seems to me. Um, I think that's it. Stay up here so we can applaud you. Uh, everyone, join me in thanking Ken Woodward and our two panelists today.